How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here once again. This time we're going to take a look at the biological effects of radiation. So our objectives will be to describe the various effects from various types of radiation on organisms and the mechanisms for them, as well as how exposure is quantified. So let's start with what is radiation? Well, radiation is simply energy that comes from a source and travels through space. So it's not a very useful definition because it's so broad, right? Candles radiate light, they radiate heat, but uranium radiates nuclear emissions, and they're not at all the same thing. So let's be more specific when we're talking about radiation. There's two types. We can have excitation radiation as well as ionization radiation. So let's talk about the difference, right? So excitation radiation, when you have that radiation come uh, and interact with matter, what it can do is it can excite an electron to a higher energy level, right? When we're talking about light being absorbed or emitted, we're talking about exciting electrons to an excited energy level uh, or falling back down to the ground state. So that's excitation. Whereas ionization radiation, it has so much energy that when an electron absorbs it, it kicks that electron out completely. So we end up with an ion. We just kicked out an electron that was negative, so we're left with a positive ion. It's ionized. That's ionization radiation. So types and sources of radiation for excitation radiation, you're exposed to that like all the time. You got sunlight that has radio waves, visible light, microwaves, infrared, cell phones give off radio waves. Those are all types of excitation radiation. Ionization radiation, you're also exposed to all the time. Sunlight with the stronger UV rays, they can cause ionization. X-rays, gamma rays, there's also nuclear radiation like alpha particles and beta particles. All those would be examples of ionization radiation. So let's talk about ionization. So most forms of life are mostly water. So when we're ta talking about what kind of ionization radiation are we interested in, we're interested in the kind that can ionize water. So the ionization energy for water is 1216 kilojoules per mole. So the radiation has to have more energy than that in order to ionize water. So the energy is going to come in and then ionizes water. It kicks off one of those electrons and you're left with H2O plus ionized water. So things that'll do that would be alpha particles. If you've heard of radon gas, radon will give off alpha particles that can ionize water. Beta particles, if you've ever talked about carbon dating before, that carbon-14 that naturally occurs uh, at certain levels, that can ionize water, as well as gamma rays, uh, x-rays, stronger UV rays, all those things can ionize water. So why is it a problem that we end up with H2O plus? That's not so much different than H2O. Why is it a problem? Well, the ionization radiation reacts with water and ejects one of its electrons, right? So we start with H2O, we end up with H2O plus. Uh, well, so what? What happens? Well, H2O plus is very, very reactive. It will react with another water molecule and steal a hydrogen and an electron from it. So we end up with H3O plus and this OH free radical. It's a neutral OH. And what's weird about it is it has an unpaired electron. Because it has an unpaired electron, it's highly, highly reactive. So this OH with this unpaired electron will react with cells and tissues and other important biological molecules and produce more free radicals. So this OH with the unpaired electron is going to be stealing electrons from important things uh, cellularly talking about molecules, DNA, whatever it is, it's stealing an electron or a hydrogen with an electron and it's making another free radical. And that free radical then can go on and repeat the process making more free radicals. So we end up with this major disruption at the cellular level. So we end up with a destructive chain reaction that's really hard to stop, right? So that's the problem with ionization ra radiation and free radicals. So exposure to ionization radiation. Believe it or not, you're constantly being exposed to ionization radiation. There's background levels from uranium ore in the ground decaying. It also gives off radon gas, which you're exposed to. Cosmic rays from space are always coming in. Living things absorb radioactive materials like radioactive potassium or radioactive carbon. So it, it's, it's everywhere, right? So that must mean it's safe though, right? No, it doesn't. All right, so effects of exposure. Let's talk about what are the effects. It depends on, one, the energy of the radiation. Are we talking about alpha emissions? They're stopped by skin. 
they're more of a bigger threat if they get into your body. If you're breathing in these emitters, then they're inside your body, so they can really wreak havoc. There's beta radiation that can penetrate up to a centimeter of your skin, so it's also going to be a bigger threat if it gets into your body. And then there's gamma. Well, it's skin's not stopping this kind of radiation. It can pass right through you. You need a whole bunch of matter to finally absorb it. Uh, this can affect your bone marrow. This stuff's not going to turn you into the Hulk. It's going to give you <laughs> cancer. It's bad. All right, so it also depends on the length of exposure. How long are you around that source of radiation? You know, this is why dentists step out of the room when they give you an x-ray. You know, you probably feel a little uncertain. You're like, I'm sitting here. They put this lead apron on me, and they're shooting x-rays at me. The guy's leaving the room. Am I okay? Yeah, you're going to be okay. But the reason the dentist leaves or the doctor leaves is because they're doing that all day. They're doing it multiple times. So they want to limit the length of their exposure to that. It also depends on if you have an internal or external exposure, right? If we're talking about nuclear radiation, it's one thing. If we're talking about nuclear fallout, it's another thing, right? So if this is a radon atom, it can emit radiation. And if it's on the outside, it's not nearly as bad as if you breathed in that radon gas and now it's in your lungs and then it's emitting all this harmful radiation. It's inside of you. It's going to be more of an issue, more of a health concern. So acceptable levels of exposure. There aren't any. This is a short answer to that. Any exposure to ionizing radiation is considered to be potentially hazardous. So you want to avoid it as much as you can. Quickly reproducing cells are damaged more by the same amount of radiation. So if a cell you know, doesn't have the time to make sure it's doing everything right and it's quickly reproducing, it's going to be more sensitive to that radiation. It's going to get affected more. So things like bone marrow, uh, blood forming tissues, lymph nodes, all those are going to be more sensitive to effects of radiation. So how do we quantify exposure? How do we put a number to how much we've been exposed? First unit we're going to talk about is the gray. So it's the absorption of one joule of energy per kilogram of tissue. There's also the RAD, which is short for radiation absorbed dose. It's the absorption of 0 0.01 joules of energy per kilogram of tissue. So if we do a little math, how can we compare the gray to the RAD? Uh, uh, one gray is roughly, is I shouldn't say roughly, it's 100 rads. All right, so 100 rads gives you one gray. Then we also got to account, again, we said the type of radiation is important, right? Not all types of radiation have the same level of effects. So we have this thing we call relative biological effectiveness, or RBE for short. So gamma, it's relative biological effectiveness is one, same with beta, whereas alpha is 10, right? So we end up with this REM, this rhodogen equivalent for man an rem equals one rad or whatever the rad is times the rbe for what kind of radiation are you being exposed to the si unit for effective dose is the severt or sv whereas one sv equals 100 rem so we got a lot of units they're all kind of measuring the same thing i would say the most important one to really understand is the rem it's the amount of energy being absorbed times the RBE, how effective is that type of radiation? It'll give you an idea of, you know, dosages and effects. So a single dose REM, if you were just exposed to it once, not a chronic thing, but more of an acute exposure. If you had 0 to 25 REM, you'd have no observable effects. 25 to 50 REM, your white blood cell count would start to decrease. If it was between 5 or 50 to 100, you'd have a significant white blood cell drop and lesions on your body. Between 100 and 200 REM, you'd start to have nausea, vomiting, you'd lose hair. Between 200 and 500, you'd have ulcers, hemorrhaging, possible death. And if you had more than 500, that, that's going to be a fatal dose for you. Let me give you an idea how much you're exposed to. For example, with a dental x-ray, you're exposed to 0 0.0005 REM. So, uh, you know, not anything to be concerned about if you're getting a single dental x-ray. Your annual background exposure, what you're just exposed to, just living for a year, is 0 0.360 REM. So these are really low doses. They're not really anything to worry about in your day-to-day. -day. Plus, there's not much you can do about it anyway. So I want to talk about cancer and radiation because we know there's a link between those. We all know that. So let's start with healthy cells. Healthy cells have instructions on how to live and how to grow. So here, here's a cell growing, living, growing. They also have instructions on how to reproduce. 
So here's the cell reproducing. Eventually it stops, right? These cells also know when to stop growing and to stop reproducing. And there's also uh, programmed cell death, apoptosis. So what's really interesting is sunburn. If you guys have ever had sunburn, that's your cells going, hey, my instructions have gotten so messed up that I need to take myself out of this. I'm going to sacrifice myself so that I don't become a cancer cell or become a problem. So, like, if these cells, you're out in the sun for too long, UV radiations ionize some of your DNA, the cells are going to go, hey, I'm, I'm a problem. I'm going to take myself out of this so you don't have to worry about it. And that's what sunburn is. So if we're talking about cancer cells, they have messed up instructions on at least one of these things. So they either don't know when to stop growing, they don't know when to stop reproducing, or they've lost the instructions on how to go through program cell death. So here's some healthy cells growing, multiplying, reproducing, and then maybe one of those cells was exposed to some ionization radiation, and it's messed up one of those instructions on it. So now it's going to, let's say, it doesn't know when to stop growing. It keeps growing, it keeps reproducing. We have this mass of cancerous cells that don't know to stop reproducing. We call that a tumor, right? So the mass of cells that continue to grow and reproduce is called a tumor. They don't know that they should stop. They lost those instructions, right? So let's say we had a tumor forming here. Tumors, they can be cut out, right? That's one treatment for if you have a cancerous tumor, you can cut it out and then it's gone. But that can be problematic depending on where the tumor is. You know, if it's somewhere that's easy easily accessible surgery may not be as complicated as if it was, let's say, like a brain tumor or something where, hey, we got a lot of important stuff surrounding it. It's going to be problematic to just remove it. Also, what's a problem is if a single cancer cell breaks free from the tumor and then enters the circulatory system or the lymphatic system, it can spread to other parts of the body, which is a real problem. If we hit one of those cells breaks off and travels through the body, it's going to end up in a new place and it's going to continue to grow and reproduce uncontrolled. This process is known as metastasis. And once cancer does this, it becomes a really tough battle to win. So let's talk about cancer treatments. It's hard to target only cancerous cells. It's basically a normal cell with messed up instructions. It's not this foreign invader. You know, if you had a uh, bacteria or a virus in your body, it's going to go, hey, I recognize that as not being me. I'm going to create antibodies, I'm going to attack it, I'm going to destroy that. But with cancer cells, it's an issue because it's it's your cell, right? It's not this foreign invader. So cancer cells tend to grow and multiply rapidly and thus are more prone to effects of radiation, right? They're more sensitive. Cells that grow quickly are more sensitive to the environment they're in. You mess up one of those cells, is going to be a lot easier to do than a slow-growing cell. So some healthy cells that grow and multiply rapidly include hair cells. So if you're probably all familiar with one of the side effects of cancer treatment is losing the hair because hair cells are rapidly growing. So they're sensitive to the treatment as well. And it's essentially, it's pretty horrific. It's essentially poisoning everything so that you kill the more sensitive cancer cells. They should die quicker than normal cells. And the hope is that one day we'll look back on cancer treatments the way we do some other barbaric treatments like bloodletting where we didn't really understand or have a better idea on how to treat people um, because it's it's really tough. So summarize, describe the various effects of various types of radiation on organisms, the mechanism for them as well, talking about free radical formation, and how exposure is quantified. So those are the, the big points that you should be able to walk away with some knowledge about. I hope you found that helpful. I'll see you in class. Goodbye. Okay,